Terms and conditions on Newstalk.com. The Football Show on Off the Ball with William Hill. Who you got? 18 plus. See gamblingcare.ie. This is News Talk. Now you're welcome along. Football show is coming at you. Very happy to say Mr. Vinnie Perth is in studio. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Great to have you with us. 64 minutes on the clock. So when we last updated you, it was 2-0 to Ireland, courtesy of early goals from Evan Ferguson and then Mikey Johnson scored as well. It has just gone 3-0. Nathan Murphy, 64 minutes on the clock. A stooping header by Matt Doherty to score Ireland's third, but an amazing flick. We couldn't see here on the TV who, who had the flick. Uh, Jamie McGrath. Jamie McGrath had the flick. It was a corner kick from Mikey Johnson over on the right-hand side, the far side of the pitch, to the near post. It was an acrobatic flick from Jamie McGrath. Turned it into the path of Matt Doherty, as you say, stooped down very low uh, to turn it in just his second international goal and turned out to be a very good night for Matt Doherty. Two assists, set up the two goals for Evan Ferguson and for Mikey Johnson and has got himself a goal as well. No real celebration from Matt Doherty. Uh, you know, he cuts a frustrated figure at times, and I think Irish supporters get very frustrated uh, with him as well. He probably doesn't have the demeanour at times that you want from an Irish international footballer where it's all blood and guts and wears his heart in his sleeve. That's not really him. He just goes about his business, and he's obviously delivered the goods for Ireland tonight. And 3-0, you'd have to say at this stage, probably the least Ireland deserve. It was a scrappy enough first half, but they took their chances through Ferguson and Johnston and... They've been well on top, well on top ever since the second half got underway. Shane Duffy had a volley that went close. Jason Knight really should have made it 3 0 five minutes after half time. Mikey Johnson's been impressive, particularly for someone who hasn't played any football at all really so far this season because of that back injury that's kept him out of Celtic start to the campaign. But again, he cut in on the left hand side onto his right foot and whipped in a brilliant cross. And Jason Knight timed his run perfectly from the edge of the area, but five yards out, somehow headed wide. Uh, a little bit of niggle kicked in then. There was a shoving match in the middle of the pitch between Annesley and Cullen. The two technical areas were at each other as well. Mikey Johnson then had a chance himself inside the area. It was sustained pressure from Ireland. Got it onto his right foot, took a deflection, and it was from that corner kick that Ireland got their third goal. A couple of changes taking place for Ireland. Adam Ida and Callum Robinson are coming on. And Mikey Johnson, his day is done on 65 minutes. As I say, he hasn't played for Celtic so far this season. So obviously deciding uh, that that is enough. And it looks as though Evan Ferguson has gone off as well. Obviously, he's had a bit of a niggly injury for the past few weeks. And, well, a big game for him against Manchester City at the weekend. So uh, that'll be his goal tally done for tonight. So Ireland 3, Gibraltar 0. Very good. We back to to you maybe in the next uh, 10 minutes or so regular chats throughout the hour with Nathan Murphy and Farrow so 65 minutes on the clock it is 3-0 to the Republic of Ireland Vinnie Perth uh, the overwhelming context here before we get into any of the Irish play good or bad is that certainly in my experience Gibraltar are the worst international side I've ever seen in person and Stuart Byrne was of the same view when they were in Dublin I mean they really are dreadful in almost every aspect, perhaps a touch more organised at times and get men behind the ball. But in the main, it's hard to think of a worse side that Ireland have played over the last decade. Yeah, and I think that that was almost the difficulty of the whole game from the management and the players. And um, it just like it's so subdued, even like Evan scored and he's someone who's, who tends to really be joyous about his goals and it was just mm, you know to the, to the that extent that I thought is he wondering about a VAR decision because then they went to VAR and we were watching here in studio and mm. Mick said oh he must know he's offside but actually I think score even for Evan Ferguson scoring for Ireland the yeah. fact that it was against Gibraltar and, and maybe given the situation in the group as well meant it was an unbelievably muted celebration for a goal in the 8th minute of a game yeah and that tells tells his own tale and I think this weekend um Normally, I would text maybe some of the staff or whatever different bits and pieces you'd hear from people, and I purposely stayed away from them because I can imagine it's a really difficult situation to be in. There's a lot of noise around this team, and um, it's a no win situation there. They win 2 3 0, so what? And, and or they only win 1 0, and they're going to get heavily criticized. So it's, it's a really difficult situation, and you get that sense. And um, you yeah, Matt thought Matt just scored, then he's. Typical, oh, it's probably typical of Matt Dory, but at the same time, doesn't over celebrate and they just move on. So it just seems a really difficult place to be at the moment. That's the first time 
Um, I've never got the sense from speaking to any players or staff that it's anyway, you know, toxic when it's coming to end of it, of it. But it's not like that. But I imagine it's uh, not a good place to be at the moment. Subdued, certainly. Yeah. And you might feel a touch foolish celebrating wildly against Gibraltar given the state of the group. Yeah, and, and the world we live in now, I mean, if you run off with your arm up in the air, are you going to get slagged for it as well in the world we live in now? So everyone's conscious of, of different things. So, yeah, I can understand it. Um, but look, they, they're doing the job. In fairness, it's, um, they're, they're, it's probably... It's probably going to send them away. There'll still be huge disappointment on this window, but at least players have got goals, they've got more caps, all of that stuff is part of the building process. And uh, for whatever happens, it's it's like it's an 18-year-old has just scored for his country again. It's ticking all those boxes. And um, yeah, it is what it is. And there's, it's just a little bit of a, uh, you know, it's yeah. done. Yeah. I think that's fair. And even the Ferguson goal, for people who haven't seen it, uh, like it, it, it probably illustrates the point we're trying to make in that it was Ogbené and Doherty in a 2v2 on the right-hand side. And almost like in slow motion, Matt Doherty just trotted off the ball between the two of them. Ogbené, Ogbené took his time and said, OK, neither of you are tracking him. I guess I'll give it to you. And then Doherty crossed it in and... Evan Ferguson got ahead of forty-year-old yeah. Roy Cipollina. So it's that kind of, it's that kind of a context, even for what's like a. If it was happening at high speed and against a better team, you'd say it was a good goal. But it, it you couldn't say it was a good goal under those circumstances. No, uh, just uh, and I suppose I've been consistent with it. When you play a lesser nation, um, and and some of the the trouble that the the sort of staff, the manager is in, is because we haven't got results against team ranked around us and below us. We can all handle, like, we've had some great performances against Portugal, uh, France, Holland, but I think this system, and I, and I keep going back to it, yes, I know you've just made the point uh, around the 40-year-old centre-half and not tracking people back, but you need to. I think we needed to play the system more against the Luxembourgs and the, the Greece te type of teams and just had a right go, and I think... I don't know what he'll, he'll probably never admit it and maybe he doesn't even think that but I think that will have to be a regret of Stevens that he didn't was more attack minded against them type of teams and the, the back three certainly hasn't worked I don't think against those teams and do you think it was that he was so burned by the initial stages and then the back three organically happened and, and seemed to look quite good against the bigger teams that he just said, well, look, this has been such a rocky period. Let's stick with this. It seems to be going okay against those lesser teams. And that's how it, ha that's how it unfolded almost. Yeah, I think, I think if you remember, like Damien Duff was involved at the start. And I'm not, I'm not saying, I obviously wasn't privy to what the discussions that happened, but Damien was working at Celtic at the time with one of his coaches. And Celtic played with a six and two eights. But with this Irish team, that left us a little bit open, if you remember the start. And we were constantly, we were playing lots of football, but we were too open uh, on the transition. And I think I think they had to move away from that. We've also got five, six, for air standard, really high level centre halves. So I can understand that. And against the top nations, it was good to change to that back three, which became a five. But... Um, yeah, we've we we haven't we haven't created enough chances against teams, as I said, and that's all to me. Like strip it all back, the performances against the top nations haven't been an awful lot. We're home with them no, in many ways. No, it's it, it's it been of... the the other ones, and we can you can probably some people are better than me remembering them, but the Luxembourgs, the yeah. you know, there's a whole list of them that people like to ream off, and I tend to I tend to forget them and move on. Um, but no, but there yeah. are a litany of those that bracket team where Ireland have just been very unconvincing. We should say the Ferguson finish was very assured, by the way. Yeah, no, uh, um, I was de I was delighted from obviously, um, um, you know, look. I don't think he'll ever get to, to Robbie Keane's goal because I don't think he, he plays in a team that's going to be no, good enough to create that amount of chances. So mm -hmm. I don't think he'll ever get to that. But the closer he gets, the the better it will be, you know, and it's something we can hold on to. So, um, no, I think, uh, look, four goals internationally at 18 years of age is, ah. is an achievement in itself. I and, know, we're taking and it for we're granted. we're almost disappointed. Like, yeah. uh, it's funny... Uh, um, Small little story. I spoke to his dad and I let it slip. Evan was disappointing. And you also, oh, 
did I say that out loud, you know, but it, like it was, it, it was just a, a difficult night against Greece, but he's only 18, we, you know, he's 19 and I think it's next week, next Thursday, Friday, mm. and we forget how young he is and, and I know, someone there's said so me, much pressure. Someone said on, on air the other day, they said, and like Ferguson will be a nice age when we have the Euros here, he'll be 23 in 2028, and I thought, that can't be right, oh my God, he will. Yeah, yeah. okay, so that puts it into context. Matt Doherty, the other score, Nathan, I think, quite rightly mentioned that there is a frustration amongst Irish fans with Darty. There has been for some time. There is, even when he was at his best, perhaps, there is a kind of laissez-faire aspect to his body language. But I think when he's not in good form, that uh, irritates people. And then he just has been so casual in possession at times. And I would say as well, so laboured off the ball in terms of his running and closing down and his tackling and his one-on-one -on -one defending and the team aren't going well and he was once upon a time one of our better performers so you swirl all that together and no surprise there was a great frustration with him he can't be fit as a starting point he just can't be given his club situation and so that that is the beginning of everything yeah i i i think um i think on friday what stood out to me was Stephen took all the blame for Friday night's performance and I understand that because I mean they've got to this situation because ultimately him as a manager is as I don't know what the right word is failed or not yeah. done well put it this but, way he doesn't he doesn't have the credit in the bank no. to withstand any bad performances now but I uh, yes and I completely like so I think that's important I say that before I make the next comment I thought the players on Friday were really poor and Matt Doherty was was the, like the players have taken more almost more responsibility for Friday's performance than yeah. the manager I thought he set them up right he, he, about time he changed that shape he had a bit tried to have a bit of a go football is all about small margins and high level sport is we could have took a lead and but that that's all gone that's excuses and, and people hear me saying that they'll say he's making excuses for a fellow he used to work with blah 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 but I think um the players, I thought, were really poor on Friday night and have to take a huge responsibility. And it's led by, led by one of your senior players. I mean, I was here on Friday night and or Friday morning and one of the things that came up was around Alan Brown. And I said, people forget how good he was in that Scotland game. We won 3-0, right wing back. And I've been sort of half making the argument that we've got to manage this team like a club side. And someone like Alan Brown, who plays week in, week out, and yes, we can go Seamus Coleman and, and Matt Doherty are better as a right wing back and we have to play them. But Alan Brown at right wing back, or when he's played for Ireland, has been very, very good for us. Mm. And I think we've missed a trick with that one. And I was making the argument on Friday morning that, you know, you we'd probably be better with someone like Alan no. Brown as a right wing back. They're um, those tricky decisions which take real bravery and you do need credit in the bank to make them yes. because if you start Alan Brown and the night still goes badly, then you're ridiculed for leaving Matt Doherty on the bench, even though it might well be the right decision on form. No, I get that. And, I, and remember, I'm, we're, we're, I sit in a cheap seat watching this and I'm able to pass comment on it, but... Um, I take your point, though. I think a lot of people would. I don't know what's happened to Doherty. And it, this has been going on for a few years now, and it's such a disappointment. Because well, it's it, since he's left Wolves, Joe. And, yeah. and you, you know, that leads to the accusation of, like, was he comfortable at Spurs? Then he went to Real Madrid, and or uh, let to go Madrid, and didn't play. So what's all that about? Like, is that... Is the, and players are entitled to make financial decisions, particularly late in their career. Mm. I would never begrudge a player of that, but... He's not playing enough football and... Yeah, not even playing now at Wolves, you no. know. And I think, see, I, it is, there is a body language aspect to him, even at the best of times, so you can overread into things. But even at times on Friday, you're watching some of the, the, the sloppiness in possession. The previous international window, there was a wild back heel in the centre circle when he took on players he had no right to be taken on. It was just beyond casual. And there were times on Friday where there might have been a switch of play out to his side... And there was a real sense of, oh, do I jog out now to this left wing? Do I, do I, yeah. like, everything is difficult for him at the moment. And and again, that could just be fitness predominantly, but that's where he is in his career, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and that's why I, I accept the Alan Brown is, is an easy one after the event, but you've got to get players in form. And I think, I think that's part of being, so, or part of a problem that's probably been a little bit missed. You look at Darrell Shea, he's just come on now. Darrell Shea was 
a starter for Ireland. He was someone who who was playing. You could see a team building around 22, 23. Yeah, good moved, character. Really, yeah. And um, uh, I, I could see res he resembled the Richard Dunn to me, uh, someone who he was nowhere near the level Richard ultimately got for him. But I could see a building of someone who wasn't the best centre half we had, but could turn out to be a really good one. Like, he's left out the other night, albeit we went to a back four. And then he, he moved Scales in to that side and Scales, and Scales starts ahead of him tonight. There's been a little bit of that where Jamie McGrath is another example where if you go back to that Portugal game in the same stadium as they yeah. played tonight, he was brilliant. Yeah. And I know he had to he moved to Wigan and it didn't work out with his club, but we just left him out of squad. And there's been... I, I, I've always said, I think Ireland a bit like Wales, a bit like Scotland, you've got to be a club side around your international team. And sometimes, within reason, you've got to ignore club form a little bit and sort of stick to a team. And I think when we when we sort of really go through the sort of Stephen Kenny era, we probably look back and say, there's been a lot of changes where, mm. I mean, some of them have been forced by Troy Parrott and his performance against Scotland and then he can't get into the squad and I just just use Dar O'Shea yeah. Parrot does it there's a lot of examples of that, which it seems a little bit that's on Stephen like for me, and that's the bit I'm I'm a little bit confused by. Give us your perspective on Nathan Collins then. Hoiked off at half time on Friday and I'll go for dropped over rested this evening, Shane Duffy in, Liam Scales in. I don't understand that. Why are, why would we do something so damaging to Nathan Collins? What did the manager see in his first half performance that was so egregious to warrant this almost embarrassment, punishment, as Ireland score a fourth? We'll give you the details in a second. And Callum Robinson with the really nice header crossing the box from the left. He heads home, Ireland 4-0 up. But that is a, a serious thing to do to a young player. And... I'm not saying he was good in the first half, but it's a big thing. So what did Stephen Kenny see that was um, so, so egregious? Yeah, I think I think some you gotta call what you see sometimes and, and to be fair, um I think the first header Greece scored, he wasn't close enough to to his map, but it was still an ultimate like a brilliant header. Yeah, decent cross too. Uh, yeah, great cross and a, a, a great goal. And then he tried to play offside for the second goal. Yeah. Sometimes you're not having a night, but but to finish the point on, and not to go back to a point, but there's uh, Shane Duffy's now back, our captain and starting, who was left out of squads. Andrew Amabamadele has been left out of squads. We, we've chopped and changed a little bit too much, and now Dara O'Shea or um, Nathan Collins is out of the team. It's a little bit tough for players to take, and I'm just so surprised by that. I can't, yeah. I can't give you a good enough answer to say that's not the way the Stephen Kenny I know works. I'm surprised by it. Yeah, because like in our Doherty conversation, there were so many little things you could see. I can see why that would just irritate the manager. But like, you never feel like Collins isn't fully committed. The mistakes were the mistakes, but I mean, there were a litany of mistakes across the evening. So it it, it really jumps out. Yeah, but he will say he he wanted to get Ryan Manning on to give us more forward play from the left back position, and he brought Scales in one and gave us that sort of left foot balance. Mm. Uh, but I don't think Scales Scales ended up having a really good night yeah. on Friday. But in the first half, I don't think he was in any way, shape, or form really good. So no, um, uh, that was it. I can understand the manager's thinking on it, but it still seems a little bit strange, as I said. Um, not, nothing worked out for him on fr mm. Friday, whatever and, decision and he made. Tonight's decision, on. though. Yeah. Um, to drop him. Yeah. Don't know. That's, that, that's a perfect chance to say, he didn't have a great night. He's going to be an important player for Aaron going forward. He's still a young man. Get him back in against your brother. Have a good night. Get on the ball. It will suit him. Because actually, frankly, I've watched Shane Duffy ping some very average... 40 yard balls that um, you know are, are, are questionable it would have been a perfect opportunity to just arm around Collins don't let Friday get to you go out and show him what you can do tonight so now it's like you're sending Nathan Collins off into a miserable month you know again I, I yeah and I think you've know. got and that's the point Omar Bamadeli hasn't played in this this window uh, this international window I don't think Daryl Shea is going to be overly happy with the manager at the end of this window and Nathan Collins certainly won't be yeah. happy with him so that is and, I, and I'll say it one more time that is not the Stephen Kenny I know yeah. that's it that's not the man management people don't see because we we, ha we have the public have this perception of Stephen that they see 
being interviewed and it's not always as polished as other people. But the people who work with him and know him will say to you, one on one, mm. he's exceptional. Mm. I mean, I've met a lot of top yeah, players people, love him. Yeah. Um, coaches. I, I've been in company of Joe Smith, Andy Farrell, all these people. And Stephen ranks when you meet him one on one in that type of person. So I'm very surprised by it. And I, I don't have a good explanation for him, unfortunately, other than shocked by it. Mm. Let's go over to Nathan Murphy. You can fill us in on that fourth goal, Robinson. Yeah, Callum Robinson with the goal uh, header across from the right-hand side from Jamie McGrath. There was a long VAR check for offside. I, I thought initially uh, on the eye test it looked as though he was maybe half a yard offside, but actually after a long delay they gave the goal. So uh, Callum Robinson back among the goals for the Republic of Ireland and it's going to be Stephen Kenny's biggest competitive win as Republic of Ireland manager and a ninth international goal for Callum Robinson straight over to the Irish fans pointing to his chest almost as a, I'm still here uh, which maybe follows up in your conversation of the players who come through under Stephen Kenny who we sort of thought uh, were the next coming and then slowly but surely faded out of the squad but Ireland have been sort of consistent with their pressure over the last 15 20 minutes since getting the third goal uh, without really having the quality to cut through the Gibraltar defense they've just tried to sort of pummel their way through again and again and again uh, they've just made another change Mark Sykes has come on in place of Chidozi Ogbeni Ogbeni another good solid game and certainly one of those who will uh, look back on the Stephen Kenny era with a lot of fondness mm. from getting his debut with Stephen Kenny over in Hungary to somebody who has really flourished uh, at club level off the back you feel of what he's been able to do at international level but it's, it's so interesting listening to you talk there when you think back to that night against Portugal and the late goals for Cristiano Ronaldo I would I'd be very interested in Stephen Kenny's thoughts if you were to have said when we come here two years on that Dar Roche, Nathan Collins, Andrew Mbamadele, Jason Malumbi, Adam Ida, Troy Paris, that none of them would have been in his starting 11 and most of them fit and available. Uh, it shows that he put a lot of faith in them very quickly, but for various different reasons, it just hasn't worked out. And as Vinny said, maybe at times the manager needed to show a little bit more patience with them as well. But look, this is a, a nice night for Stephen Kenny, I think, after the pressure of Friday and the definite sense leaving the stadium of the inevitability that it's over. And I spoke to a lot of Irish fans uh, before the game and said, like, is there any way back? Do you see any way back? And almost all of them said that they were fairly ardent supporters of Stephen Kenny, that they wanted to give him time. They showed a lot of patience, but that this campaign just just hasn't been good enough. So, look, this, I think, will be uh, an evening Stephen Kenny can enjoy and maybe... And you'd have to think now probably is going to be enough to give him those couple of games next month as well. And while he speaks of feeling that his contract gets him through to a playoff, uh, I think that if you look at the results tonight and Portugal absolutely hammering Bosnia, it was what, 5 nil at half time the last I saw, which is a, another dagger through the hearts of Ireland's uh, very slim chances of getting a playoff. So, you know, it's coming to an end. It's just a matter you feel now of when, not if. You just said there, Nathan, about Stephen having a good night. The question, because you can, you can sort of hear very clearly across the TV stuff that's been shouted. Why, why do you, what's your sense of it being really subdued and uh, goals not being even celebrated, which it seems really strange? I think he touched on it almost probably a sense of embarrassment from the players that in the big games, in the big moments during this campaign, they've been found wanting. And at the second half, on Friday night in front of an Aviva Stadium with 40,000 people there just wasn't good enough. And you're right, the manager has to take a lot of uh, a lot of the stick that goes with that. But the players also do. It was as flat as I've ever seen an Irish team in the second half. Never came out after halftime with any fire in their belly. All the things of wanting to pull on the green jersey. None of that was there in that second half. And look, maybe that should come from the manager first and foremost. Maybe they didn't get what they needed at halftime to try and force their way back into the game. But I think, as Joe touched on, this is a, a pretty shocking international side that Gibraltar have. That there'll be questions again after this campaign as to whether there should be some sort of pre-qualifying before they get to this stage. Uh, and I think the players understand that. They're going around with wild celebrations that uh, wouldn't really be appropriate on a night like this. But listen, you have to give enormous credit to the Irish supporters. Again, the three and a half thousand of them would come over here for what is essentially a dead rubber. I know they'll have booked it uh, long before Friday night, but 
they've certainly given the team a lot of support. They've certainly given the players a lot of backing. There's been no sense at any stage of any booze or anything like that tonight. There's a sense that, you know, they wanted the players to come here to get a few goals, to to give them a good evening out. But I, I don't think anything can change the overall complexion of, of where this group is right now. And look, it's not in a good place. It's two victories against Gibraltar and five defeats. It's It's those two games against Greece that there's just probably no way back from. And before you go for the time being, there was no whisper of an injury around Nathan Collins, was there? No, no. And, you know, Stephen Kenny was asked about it in his press conference after the match. Is that it was a rare opportunity there for Gibraltar and uh, into the side netting from a very tight angle uh, on the volley. Uh, but, no, he was asked in the initial press conference, uh, was it a tactical decision to take him off at half time? He said it was. Uh, I asked him yesterday again, had he spoken with Nathan Collins? Was there any feedback from Nathan Collins? So you'd have to imagine uh, playing week in week out in the Premier League been somewhat embarrassingly hauled off at half time uh, might not have been too happy about it now if there was any uh, chit chat between manager and player over the couple of days Stephen Kenny certainly was denying it but no I think this is clearly a, a tactical decision that Kenny has made and maybe uh, trying to show his frustration with the player that you know he might feel that the two goals are largely down to the mistakes that the Collins made I think Collins is going to be a big part of whatever Ireland do over uh, the next few years, you'd have to feel the level he is playing at. But look, he has, he's, he's so young that most centre-backs at that age make mistakes. We have just such high expectations from that. The couple of errors he's made already for this season at Brentford when they play such a risky brand of football, the way they try and play it out from the back. They, Thomas Frank wants them to take on that pressure, wants them to take on that load of bringing it right up into a player's face before you release it. And sometimes he takes that little bit too much out of it. It was just pure bad defending on on Friday night but as I say I think if we were sitting here 18 months ago we probably would have thought an Irish defence tonight might be a back three of Oma Bamadele, Collins and O'Shea and all three of them sat on the bench Yeah it's very striking when you consider it's the same ground and here we are two years later Let's take a short break Vinny is staying with us Nathan still in uh, Faro Gibraltar nil Ireland 4 90 minutes on the clock Football on Off The Ball With William Hill Who you got? 18 plus see gamblingcare.ie This is News Talk Screen Time with John Fardy Action! This week on the show I talk to legendary Irish director Thaddeus O'Sullivan about his new movie The Miracle Club which sees a group of women in 1960s working class Dublin head to Lourdes looking for, well, miracles Booker Prize winner John Banville chats to me about his favourite film and Chris Wasser reviews the week's new movie releases. Screen Time with John Fardy. Listen to the podcast now on Newstalk.com or the Newstalk app powered by Go Loud. Newstalk. Conversation that counts. And cut! At Three Business, we've made it our business to help your business save money. Our new handset and SIM-only plans are packed full of value starting from just 15 euro a month and all in Ireland's fastest mobile network. Now that's a deal you can't refuse. Sign up to 3Business in-store or at 3.ie forward slash business. 12-month minimum term, subject to annual price increase every April. See 3.ie. Fastest base and analysis by Uglove Speed Test Intelligence data Q1 to Q2 2023. Get ready for it. With Prime Video, you're guaranteed big smiles and great value. Watch exclusive titles like the fantasy series Wheel of Time. Everyone has a choice. The Continental from the world of John Wick. I'm offering you a chance to decide who you want to be. The musical movie Greatest Days. Here I am. And so much more. Stream only on Prime Video. And that is the only thing that matters. Start your 30-day free trial now. Guaranteed Irish business members continue to sustain jobs and communities across Ireland. Like Big Red Cloud, whose award-winning accounts and payroll software is exactly what your business needs. Fully automated features like bank feeds and importing invoices gives you more time to work on your business and not in it. Now with free training in conjunction with KWETB. For a free trial, go to bigredcloud.com forward slash training. So look out for the G, guaranteedirish.ie, all together better. 
sometimes life throws up unexpected events at home. That's why people choose Britain Insurance. With materials and rebuilding costs on the up, it's important that your home and possessions are adequately covered. We'll make sure you have the right cover in place. With a direct line to your team member and access to our claims department 24-7, you're covered with Britain Home Insurance. Pat Britain and Company Limited Trading as Britain Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Dun Deal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars from all of Ireland's trusted car dealerships. That's why you'll find Frank Keane Volkswagen Sandyford on Dun Deal. Visit the Frank Keane Volkswagen Sandyford showroom on Dun Deal to find your next car. Dun Deal Motors, for deals to feel great about from all of Ireland's trusted car dealerships. Football on Off the Ball with William Hill. Who you got? 18 plus. See gamblingcare.ie. This is News Talk. You're very welcome, Max. So, Gibraltar nil, Ireland 4 is into added time, and it's been a comprehensive victory. Ireland were never going to lose this game. And in fairness, it's a perfectly respectable scoreline for an under pressure team, an under pressure manager. Very muted atmosphere, even when they scored the goals, as we've been noting, if you're just. Uh, tuning in. Vinnie Perth is here in studio. Nathan is at the stadium. Just to bring you up to speed on uh, dreadful news really in this world of ours which is just um, in a strange old place I think it's fair to say. So Brussels is on its highest level of security alert after two Swedish I'm presuming Swedish fans. It's Sweden playing Belgium this evening. Two Swedes were shot dead in the centre of the city. Uh, Belgium's Prime Minister reports The Guardian suggested that the attack was linked to terrorism. So he's offered his uh, condolences to the Swedish Prime Minister. As close partners, the fight against terrorism is a joint one. So police have warned that the suspect remains on the run. Uh, the alleged gunman wearing a fluorescent orange jacket fled the scene after using an automatic rival. That's according to local news reports. Uh, media reports aired amateur videos showing a man firing several shots near a station using a large weapon. Belgian broadcasters said the two victims were Swedes. So obviously the Swedish team played the first half, it seems, and presumably the players heard what had happened at half time or somebody thought, we're not, you know, this is not right to continue playing. So the match has been abandoned at half time. Uh, the incident happened about 5k away from Heysel Stadium. The crowd have been told to stay inside the stadium. And uh, there is a video claiming responsibility, says The Guardian, for the shooting circulating on social media in which a man speaks Arabic, a source close to the case, uh, said. So the threat level in Brussels raised to level four, rest of the country to level three. So just a um, shocking situation in Belgium around this game. And that game, needless to say, has been abandoned. So that's the latest news from uh, the world of football this evening. Uh, Vinnie Pert still here in the studio. Uh, Nathan at the game where it's gone full time. So uh, Greece and the Netherlands have drawn nil all. So it does mean Greece are in second place. They have played an extra game to the Netherlands. And uh, Netherlands will play Republic of Ireland in the final round of fixtures and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Nathan, you're back with us. Yeah, I am. I am back with you. Is, has that one finished in Athens? Because uh, what I saw a second ago is that in the 94th minute, oh. the Dutch have just got a second penalty, which could well send them towards automatic qualification. And I think they've scored us as well. Virgil van Dijk was going up to take it. Van Beekhurst missed the penalty in the first half. Uh, and that will put yes. pay to uh Greece chance of qualifying automatically and the Dutch will join France in taking that Correct. place and listen they're celebrating the three and a half thousand fans here in Faro Ireland have got themselves a four nil win two goals in either half but results tonight essentially mean that Ireland's chances of getting a playoff are done as well and we will not be in Germany next summer but uh, a decent reception for the players. Uh, Stephen Kenny is uh, getting a lot closer to the supporters tonight with his applause than he did on Friday night where the players uh, went around with their heads hanging uh, after what had happened against Greece. And Stephen Kenny, just the, the look on his face and looking at him on the screen here in front of me, almost a, a thankful applause to the Irish fans for sticking with him and appreciative of the fact that they've made this trip and... Uh, that he's probably had this night and this rare moment of joy, particularly over the last 18 months. As you can hear, there's a bit of singing, a bit of dancing, and uh, everything you'd expect when you come to play Gibraltar. 
Well, I suppose, Nathan, these would be his most ardent supporters, the most hardcore supporters of the Irish team, who I, I think have never really wanted to see um, Stephen Kenny uh, go this way. And, I, and, and probably all of them might still be the last few who'd be saying, you know what, maybe there's something still here. They, they would be his people, his constituency. Yeah, they absolutely would. And uh, maybe they're the most important constituency and that they are the ones who are travelling here on a what is it, a Monday night to Portugal in October to come and support their team against Gibraltar. And, you know, they're hardcore Irish football fans. I do think that the vast majority of them have changed their tune over uh, recent months, particularly the defeat against Greece was an absolute killer for any sort of momentum that they had. And then the defeat on Friday night in the atmosphere in the stadium, the fact that there was barely anybody left and anyone who was left was booing the team off the pitch, uh, probably tells you where they are. This is a nice little moment, I think, for the players and a little bit of light relief that they get to have this and you know more of a spring in their step when they go to Amsterdam next month to take on the Netherlands but I think unfortunately for Stephen Kenny even his most ardent supporters feel that the results they just haven't been there and as he said when he spoke to the Sunday newspapers that you know anything he says will sound like an excuse and he's all out of excuses at this stage so yeah it's I'm sure Stephen Kenny will uh, enjoy this and it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say and how he tries to pick this up but I don't think there's a huge amount you can really take from uh, beating Gibraltar by four goals to nil they brought on Lee Casquiaro in the second half he's 42 years of age uh, they had a 40 year old starting at centre back and look Ireland were full value for the four nil they got that early goal through Evan Ferguson Mikey Johnson at the second by half time and that's what you want on a night like this you've, you've totally eased the pressure that's on you because we saw when Gibraltar came to Dublin and scored us at half time and you're going wow is this the night is this the night that they finally go and get something but you know they pushed on they certainly deserved that third goal through Matt Doherty Callum Robinson comes off the bench he gets one as well so it was a good solid professional job well done but it does feel as if we're in a different phase now in terms of this Irish management position and that uh, the next month is probably going to be dominated more so by speculation as to who will come in next rather than whether Stephen Kenny will stay in the role yes and Vinny, I mean, given your uh, relationship with Stephen Kenny, I mean, there's going to be no sense of you calling for a head or saying, you know, wanting taking any relish in talking about the next Irish manager. But it, it does, I mean, look for all the world like this is the long goodbye at the moment. It is very hard to make a, a really strong case for Stephen Kenny to have his contract renewed. Even Stephen Kenny, as Nathan referenced in his press conference, for the very first time said, well, look, there's no point in me making an argument. I can't win it anyway. The, the weight of results are such... Yeah, I, th I think if he hadn't said that, I probably would have dodged the question or, or left studio and said, I guess someone else answered that one. But I think he's, I think the, the way he's spoken the last couple of days is basically he's he's accepted he is where he is. And um, yeah, I, I think for the last maybe year and 18 months, I've, um, I've said I feel he's going to regret certain things he has done. And I think in the next year, He'd sit down somewhere and go. I didn't do. I didn't fail my way. That's that's the way I see it. I don't think he felt his way. And um, yeah, just I. I think. I think a lot of people have travelled. Like a lot of people from sort of outside the inner workings of Irish football didn't understand why he got so much support. But we probably wanted one of our own to do really, really well. And I think people are good that it hasn't worked out. And I, I'd actually be one of them. I, I I'm good that it hasn't worked out from because. Um, the solution, the solution to this problem is probably flying someone in and out for a couple of internationals and then heading back to somewhere else, and that's not good for where we are in Irish football. And we won't go into that tonight, but I went on a big enough rant about that last Friday here. So, but um, I, I'm worried about where we're going next, and that's the problem. So it doesn't uh, fill your heart with glee to be chucking Gus Poyet half a million a year and. Back to that kind of routine. I just don't think Gus Poyet takes half a million a year. I think he'd say treble, and I might think about it. So well, I was very taken with the Irish tracksuits. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> look, um, there is an argument to be made that someone of a higher level could get more out of his team. But also, I think it's worth somebody making the point. And I, I've probably been critical of Stephen as well. So I think it's fair that I make the point to say there's a huge amount of heavy lifting done with this team as well. And I think I think we have to we have to uh, bring that up at different stages. Yeah. And who, say who, whoever the next manager in and the manager after that yeah. in, 
owes Stephen Kenny a Christmas card. Absolutely, and and but that's not a, that's not a pass. I'm not trying to make a pass before no, I jump. It's a reality. It's a, of, it, it is an aspect of the job he has done. It he, has been a period of transition which he has overseen, and and it's not just being around the players. The 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 staff. Um, when players come in, there's such a high level in the UK, in particular, of the way clubs are run between between the, the GPS to between uh, sports science, between the medical departments, all of that stuff has been improved mm. under Stephen. That's what players will tell you. It's They will say that that, that part of it has improved. So I think, I think, look, credit where credit's due for that part. But ultimately, like, look, results are results. And I just, I'm just concerned about where we're heading. And, and this is just another sort of, another hammer blow for... People who live on the ground, I don't just live on the ground in terms of Irish football. I love football. I'll be in Man Manchester City and Brighton this Saturday just as a fan. So I do the same thing as all those people that us so-called hardcore criticise. Um, delighted that the Euros is coming. I'm just not happy that it's taken away from fixing other stuff. But this is just another bit of a blow, I feel, to Irish local soccer if that word makes sense I think this is another blow to it how this is going to end and um, it's just another stick to beat us with but look we are where we are the results haven't been good enough and ultimately I don't think Stephen can have any complaints Nathan a final word from you I suppose what, what you can take from this evening is that disaster averted if tonight had been a laboured 1-0 win or even worse as hard as that is to fathom give against such poor opposition then there would have been a grand swell of opinion that the plaster needs to be torn off now as opposed to next month whereas a win tonight it's a degree of coolant on the situation and i suppose stephen kenny gets his farewell on that tuesday against new zealand after the game in amsterdam and that's that's where we are the the long goodbye goes on for another month yeah, I think that's exactly it. Like, it's interesting you say a laboured one nil win. I, it, one thing I would point out as this conversation happens over the coming months is there's going to be an awful lot of revisionism about what's gone before Stephen Kenny. A laboured one nil win away at Gibraltar is what happened the last time we played them under Mick McCarthy. Likewise, it was a laboured two nil win when they came to Dublin. These sort of performances, these struggles have been coming for a long, long time. The latter end of the Martin O'Neill era, post Euro 2016, there were some tough times. We were on the edge of the cliff, it felt, with Mick McCarthy, and obviously it feels we've fallen over that now. Uh, but we should point out, as Vinny said, that you know Stephen Kenny has done a lot of good things for Irish football. He's brought through a lot of players. And I think a lot of the Irish support over there, they were so desperate for him to do well because of how hard he worked. Like I remember talking to Seamus Coleman right when he was first appointed and asking Coleman about what he knew of Stephen Kenny because there were questions at the time, well, would those senior players respect someone of the League of Ireland background? And you know, Coleman said, the one thing I always respect is someone who's worked hard to get somewhere in life. And that's what Stephen Kenny has done. And this was an Irish side tonight that had seven League of Ireland, former League of Ireland players playing for Ireland. So like that text that will come in again and again of he was a League of Ireland manager, I think just misses the point completely when it comes to Irish football and what he's had to do to get here. It clearly hasn't gone well at all in terms of results. And understandably, he has to be in a position now where uh, there's not just questions. I think we probably have the answer as to what's going to happen. But I think we also have to look at what had gone before and not uh, look back at some sort of rose tinted glasses that everything was perfect. And Stephen Kenny came in and took Ireland to... Uh, whole new lows these lows are becoming unfortunately more regular over the last seven eight years and as you say whoever comes in next there are no guarantees when you're heading into another nation's league and world cup qualifiers that there's going to be an automatic uplift so look as you say tonight a good night four goals a bit of a buzz going into amsterdam for the players a bit more confidence and it probably does get him that final night for himself and james mclean uh, who'll be playing that night against New Zealand as well and maybe a, a decent crowd at, at Lansdowne Road for that but uh, I think that's probably as far as it'll go OK, we'll let you go Thanks Emil Thanks lads Cheers Vinny, just a final uh, question for you um, Michael outside was wondering and I was kind of thinking to myself as well where next for Stephen Kenny? Yeah, that's that's the hard bit um, because it's gone so like results have gone so poorly where, where you can pick certain positives out of it in terms of development of players and um you don't see a championship club or a league one club hiring Stephen Kenny because of the results have been that bad. Um so 
I would really struggle to come up with somewhere where I could say to you. Um, Is he the type that would love football so much that going back into League of Ireland wouldn't be too much of a, I don't want to use the phrase step down for him, but, uh, you know, you take the point. Yeah, um, I think I think that would be difficult. That would be in a passing of time. You're talking about three, four years, but re- relatively a young man like um, is he can't, can't just not work for the next fifteen years. No, you can't, and that's the that's the thing. And um, people would say make a great sporting director, and I'm not sure that I don't think he w- would know him. So that's where I have a challenge with what's next. Um, you need to rebuild your career. I mean, it's not the same, but uh, had a very similar situation in Shamrock Rovers where he was he was when it when that didn't go well. There was a huge amount of criticism and people people were really heavy on him. And mm. although that was a, a minor minor level for want of a better word compared to where he is now, uh, he had to go off and rebuild himself, yeah. and he done that in spectacular fashion. Had the resolve to do it. Um, has he got that resolve to go and do it again? I don't know. And in in sport and football, in you need a little bit of luck and someone to take a chance on him and there might be someone in in Austria and Finland in America as I said or in mm. Australia that goes we, we take a chance on this guy so it's very very difficult to see where the next move is but it's not um, he's made good money but he hasn't made life changing money so he's got 15 years before he's 65 there thereabouts so he, he's got to go again and work and he's been full time in football for close on 20, 25 mm, years. So yeah. it's a difficult situation for him personally um, in that sense, what he does next. But he, he needs a bit of time out from the game. Um, I, I've i mixed emotions around Stephen. We've sort of, we were like, he was a big brother to me and now we don't speak that often. And I'm looking at him now and I don't see, I just see someone who, who needs a break now. And if he'd have been taken out of this game tonight and told... You know, we'll get John O'Shea for argument's sake to take the team. I wouldn't have been too disappointed because I felt he he needed that break. But winning tonight is probably going to help him, and he probably deserves. A lot of people would say to you, League of Ireland people, and would say to you, he probably deserves that last couple of games and a round of applause in the Viva Stadium. Yeah. And thanks very much. And that's a measure of he's probably a good guy, and people will see that. I think that's absolutely true, and, and I think he'll get a very good send off on Tuesday night at the Viva Stadium, and deserves it in many ways. Uh, Vinny, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate having you in. And uh, we'll wrap the football show up there. 4-0 win for Ireland away to Gibraltar. Football on Off the Ball. With William Hill. Who you got? 18 plus. See gamblingcare.ie. This is News Talk. Hey, did someone put the immersion on? Yeah, me, Dad.